In this video we're going to take a look at some of the challenges from the Country to Country 2021 qualifier round. I've actually competed in the CTF for a couple of years in a row now. It used to be the Cambridge to Cambridge competition and you would have students in Cambridge, England and in Cambridge, Massachusetts would do the qualifier rounds and then the finals would be between the two countries. Uh, whereby some people from the UK would go over to the US one year and then vice versa the next year but it seems to be open to all countries now it's still just for university students so this will actually be the last year that I'm able to compete I'll leave some links in the description anyway to the competition in case you're a university student or you will be and you'll be interested in participating in the future years and um, with that out of the way let's go and check out some of the challenges this challenge is called Groups Policy. It's a crypto challenge and the description says you discover the enemy has established persistence by installing a scheduled task on your system with Group Policy. Within the Group Policy you've discovered a rogue administrative account. Can you determine the password for the rogue admin account? And we have this zip file to download which I've already downloaded and extracted. It has an XML file inside of it so I'm going to open that up in Codium. You can open it up with your text editor of choice. I'm using Codium just so we have some syntax highlights in and um, so it formats it quite nicely as well. Uh, let me just also do Alt and Z, so we've got word wrap on, and we can see here that we have uh, in this properties tag we have a comment saying password is encrypted, very secure, it's going to run as totally not rogue admin, and then we have this C password. So um, it looks like it's encrypted, let's go and have a quick look. We would basically want to do a little bit of research here and try and find out what is C password and what's the problem with it. In this case, I'm just going to open up this article, which I already you can see it's quite an old one. Um, why passwords in group policy preference are very bad. And it's going to take a while for me to load this, but if we go and have a look through the information here, we'll find that it's very bad because um, the password that's used to encrypt is AES 32 byte encryption. It's very weak, and uh, essentially that means we'll be able to crack it. So there's actually a tool that we can use if you're using Kali or Parrot or something you should you should have this installed already if not you might be able to do sudo apt get we'll have a look at the github and we have this gpp decrypt you can see here it takes in an, some encrypted data so let me take a copy of the string this c password and let's try and run that again this time with the password and you'll see here we get this brimful Estonia clothing emblem downpour. So there's our flag. We just need to go and wrap that up in the flag uh, format and submit it. The next challenge is called Secret Operator. It's a scripting challenge, and the description says this piece of code uses the secret slide to operator. What would the value of x be to make the output a number with 190 digits? The flag will be in the format. Etc. And we have this zip file to download again. I've downloaded it, I've extracted it, and we have this slide2.png which shows us some code here. We have this while loop and the x, and then we have this slide down to a zero and the print. Um, so let me just go and open up first of all. Oh, no, I still have that saved. Let me just grab this link. So we can go and have a look and see what is this operator. and how was it used. I basically went here and grabbed this code and modified it slightly just to match the little screenshot that we have and you can see here it's not an operator, it's in fact two separate operators, the dash dash and then the angular bracket. The conditional code decrements x while returning x as original not decremented value and then compares the original with uh, etc. So we have some examples here we can use. I didn't really look into this too much. I grabbed the script that we have there modified it slightly to match our screenshot and then compiled it. So let me go and open this up. We'll do code.c and I'm going to paste this in here. Let me zoom in a bit on the... So uh, yeah, we basically, we basically just want to print this out. Now the funny thing is whenever I ran this I just set x to 100 to begin with and let's go ahead and do gcc uh, code.c-o code. Let's make it executable and let's try and run it. You'll see it prints out this value and I thought I was going to have to go and play around with this but actually if you just go and open up, let's open up Sublime here 
and you'll see here 190 characters selected. So actually it turned out that 100 was the correct answer, so we just need to submit flag 100 and there we go. The next challenge is called Sun Tzu and we have a website to open this time, nothing to download. There are a couple of hints available to us but let's just go and take a look at this site first of all. Fast SAC service and we have a form that we can fill in here, name, issue and then a capture that we have to fill in which is going to stop us from being able to brute force it or put it into burp repeater too easily but um, whenever I came across this I tried a few things in here, I tried to well let's first of all just have a look and see if we just submit say admin what's the issue you're experiencing um, hello we want to kind of get an idea is whatever we submit here going to be reflected anywhere to the page and then we'll have a better idea what payloads we might be able to give it. You can see here it's reflected our name admin to the page and it's given us this ticket so we might want to have a look and see has that just created a ticket. We could try and have a look for tickets or ticket something like that. Um, in this case we don't get anything but we have this admin bit that's reflected here so we could try and well we could try and put in a script here, let's do script and I'll just throw in alert zero although we shouldn't really use that let me just throw that here as well although this isn't being reflected to us so it's not really it's not really much point and we don't get anything that's been filtered out or it hasn't um, executed the script anyway so uh, after that I also tried just putting in the name here as an asterisk and let's try that, let's do star, let's leave this as nothing, let's do the capture and we can submit that and it actually comes back and says thank you assets which I thought was interesting so we know that there's going to be some assets here if you're going to have a look at the view page source we should see in here assets can be pointing to our JavaScript and to our CSS and things like that um, so why don't we try and do dot dot slash and have a look to see what's in there and we get the capture code wrong okay dot dot slash it's kind of an annoying thing to have on the challenge but oh well. and we see the HTML. So we can do this, we can go around and we can have a look. I actually thought that we were trying to find out the username so I went back to the home directory um, but wasn't able to find it there. Although what I did notice is essentially, so I mean whenever we do, let's do star again here which, which will return the assets. BVB5A we have the assets there but what if we were to do F star NPHDU and you'll see it has flag.txt so there's actually a flag.txt file here let's go and take a look at that and we have a text file which says know yourself you'll win all the battles just a quote and who are you so um, just a rabbit hole there for us really but uh, what I realized at this point is we just have a straight up command injection here right so that's listing, whenever we use the wildcard there, it was looking for the first file that it could find with um, beginning with an F. But if we just go ahead and let's just put in a semicolon here and then say ls. And let's do the capture again. And in this case, you see it gives us our ticket, but it then also lists all the files that are available in this home directory. And one of them is this flag with a long kind of hash looking string after it, which looks like it'll probably be the one for us. So you can see that that's retrieved the correct flag. The next challenge is called Lost and Found. It's a Stego challenge. And the description says, a previous infiltration of the vacuum cleaners has, has finally produced a floor plan of Jack Corp's control center. Is there any further information you can provide us with? And we have the file to download. I've already downloaded it and extracted it. We've got this image in there, which is a maze. And um, I tried a few things here. The first thing I normally do with any PNG image, well, the first thing with any of these challenges normally is just have a look at the EXIF data. Um, 
have a look for strings, maybe strings greater than 10, just in case there's anything sticking out or a password or something like that in there worth grabbing. You might see a base64 encoded string, things like that. Um, also, zsteg is good for PNG images, so if you do zsteg-a for all checks on lost and found, and in this case we actually get all the these hex values uh, which appear to be part of the exif data. I did actually initially extract these and separate them onto new lines properly, um, but it just seemed to be the data of the image that was in here for some reason. Anyway, uh, that wasn't the solution. Let me skip to the solution. So we can open this up in Stegsolve and it just allows us to go through and kind of visually analyze the images, the different bit planes and things like that. So let's open up Lost and Found and go through here. We can just hit the little arrows down at the bottom and this is, first of all, we've inverted it. So we've done an XOR on the image, turned all the white into black and vice versa. And then we can go through the different planes. So we've got the uh, eight different alpha planes here, the eight bits. And then we have the same for the red. We can go through those. We have the same for the green. We have the same for the blue. Nothing is changing. Although, look what happens when we get down to blue plane zero. We see this flag. Paint is the, the old cool, school cool. So we could go ahead and save this if we wanted to as a separate image so we can go and zoom in because there's no zoom option on this tool, unfortunately. Um, but you can read that clearly enough to go and submit the flag anyway. The next challenge is called Invisible Ink. It's a stego challenge and the description says, Holy Lemons Batman, it's the steganographer. He emailed us a blank image. I wonder what that what dastardly plot he's up to this time. So again, we've got a file to download. I've already downloaded it and unzipped it. Uh, it doesn't look like there's anything of interest there, but if we, again, being a PNG image, I did the usual checks here, have a look at the strings, XIF, um, ZSteg, but again, if we jump over to Steg Solve for this one, just so we can analyze the actual visual properties, let's open it up, and we can go through here, we've got a normal, we've got a color inversion, we've got our different planes, and we can basically go through, not seeing anything of interest, not seeing anything of interest, full alpha, full red, full green, full blue, and then random. So once we get onto this random color map, and we can do this a couple of times, we get our flag, which is the flag lemon juice. And presumably then if, if um, presumably it's just a slightly different shade of white. So if we would have just put this into paint and um, use the paint bucket, I'm sure we would have got the same result there. But another easy enough stego challenge. The next challenge is called Leaving with Cash and Traces. It's a missed challenge and the description says, Somehow Adam was hacked and the secret of Eve was being kept by Adam. Please delve into Adam's backup.ab and determine the secrets. If anyone asks you the password, tell them 1 to 7. So we have this zip file to download. I've already downloaded it and unzipped it. So we have this backup.ab file. Let's have a look at it. Backup.ab It's an Android backup version 1 encrypted with AES-256. Let's try and run strings anyway and see if there's anything of interest. Presumably not, since it's got 256-bit um, encryption on it. Uh, so what we can do is go and have a look at the Android Backup Extractor, which is a tool that would be used to create these backups and then also to restore them as well. Uh, we can go here, there's some options to install this, uh, to sorry, to build this yourself, or you can go and find the releases, which are right here, and we'll just download this jar rather than worry about building it ourselves. What I am going to do is I'm going to make a new directory, backup, I'm going to move the backup file into the backup directory, and let's get this jar file downloaded. Uh, just because it's going to extract everything there and we don't, we don't want to mess up the desktop too much. And I'm going to do java-jar and we can go and have a look at the documentation there but essentially what we need to provide is pack or unpack. I'm going to unpack in this case and we're going to unpack the backup.ab. We can then set that to backup.tar which is where it's going to move it to. And if we try and run that, you'll see it says the backup is encrypted. Please provide the password. We were told 1 to 7. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. 
you can see that that's writing that out to backup tar so now we should have this backup.tar which we do let's do tar xvf backup and you can see it starts to extract all of these files you can see we've got some uh, this telegram folder with a hidden folder in it cached and then we have some recordings in there we have some images in the whatsapp images folder we've got this twilight.wav file and we have some screenshots as well to look at so the rest of these directories appear to be empty um, so we'll need to go and focus on these let's run tree and get an idea exactly where to go and take a look so just so we can browse some of these images let's go and do this in the folder instead we can go into pictures that was uh, the screenshots here where we have some pictures of some clothing items and then we've got some whatsapp messages so there's three pictures of whatsapp messages let's look at the times we have a 3.22 a.m. it starts it's saying hello um, I have a sh want to share a secret here's a secret it's covered up so we can't see it okay next message I have no idea what to do next is that the right one no it's this one hey that audio is missing what what happened the audio you sent me I missed it okay so there's some audio the audio was weird what was it about I'll ping you on WhatsApp. Check. I had a shared. I had shared a picture. It's in the metadata. Okay. And then they're also saying here. That's the same thing. Okay. Check the metadata. And the voice clip. Okay. All right. So we need to go and take a look at some of this stuff. So we could. Um, I mean, we could have a look in that folder as well. So let's go into WhatsApp pictures. Was it pictures? No, it was just pictures, wasn't it? Go to pictures, screenshots. We might want to go in here and have a look. Exif tool, because they mentioned metadata there. We could have a look at the exif for each of these images. Um, spoiler alert: there wasn't anything of interest in there. So we can go and have a look at some of the other folders. We had the Telegram folder. Let's go and take a look at that. I remember we have this. Um, hidden folder in here dot cached so let's go and take a look at dot cached and these wave recordings let me go and try and open some of these up actually so we want to set this to view hidden files and then we can go and have a look so there's actually some morse code sounding like so we can basically go and translate these online we can go to let's have a look Morse code I've got it in the favorites uh, we can upload audio files or we can provide it as text let me see where's a decoder adaptive audio decoder and if we go and open these up uh, backup telegram Okay, hidden, show hidden files, cached. Yeah, we can go and start opening these up and play. And you'll see then it's going to come up with some messages. Let's try another one. I know that uh, most of these are just fake messages. It'll just come up with like fake flag or not important and things like that. So I did go through all of these. Let me uh, find the correct one. It was 123. So we can go ahead and let me clear the message. We'll play this. And it actually takes quite a while to print out this message. But um, what I'm going to do is I'll go and copy the actual message. You can see here, it's going to say, I am leaving to London for a few months. The image is, uh, let me just stop it. And I'm going to stop that. I'm going to go and open this up in Sublime. Paste this in here. So this was the message. I'm leaving to London for a few months. The image is embedded with um, that ext file contains my secret. Keep it with you. The password is I know magic all in small letters except I. So we know that there's an image, we know that that's the password for the image. So I um, I went and tried to uh, run Steghide against some of the images that were in the WhatsApp images there, but I didn't find much. So what we want to try and do is see 
where the other images were, we have this uh, magic.jpg. So let's go WhatsApp media WhatsApp images. And then if we try and do steg hide, extract, stego file, magic, and then the password it wants, I know magic. And there we get our flag. And the password there was I know. Oh. Uh, so both of the I's were capitalized. I had a, little, a bit of problems with that whenever I was trying to solve it initially. The next challenge is called Trapdoor. It's a data forensics and instant response challenge. And the description says, what is a local infected computer's domain name where the backdoor call to the C2 is? And then we have this URL. So we could try and open this up. It's not actually going to load anything for us. Let's go and open up Google or your search engine of choice and just try and search for the domain name. And if we do that, we should get some articles giving us a hint as to what the challenge is going to involve. You can see here straight away it's telling us about the solar winds compromise. So if we do a little bit of research, essentially we're going to find out that this is. Uh, the domain name is from the SolarWinds hack, or it's it's using the domain name generation algorithm uh, that was used in SolarWinds. So if we open up this article here, we can see um, that we have some very similar looking URLs here, and then they're translating to different domains. So we can, let's follow this a little bit, we'll go and have a look at the original tweet that this came from, and see if there's a tool that we can use to do the same kind of deobfuscation. So this links us to a GitHub account which actually has the Sunburst domain generation algorithm decoder script. So we can go and download that And we could have a look at it, see what's actually happening with the code. Let me just go and grab that domain name again. You can see Kaspersky's been very kind and blocked that malicious website. Um, okay, so this is the code that we have here. So we don't really need to worry about this too much. We can see there's some base32 encoding and decoding. We're converting from integers to hex. And um, we have what looks like, I guess, some kind of salt. Yeah, it actually says salt there. Um, so this is a custom domain uh, domain generation algorithm, uh, which was used for the malware. But let's just try and run the tool. I'm going to do echo. I'm going to give it this the first part of our domain name that we we're asked to check, and let's send that to Python decode. We'll get some errors because we're using Python three on a Python two script. But if we use Python 2, we'll get this domain favro.local and we can submit that and that's actually the flag in this case. The next challenge is called Pony is a Pwn warm-up and it's an exploitation challenge. The description says can you capture the flag from our service? You'll need two things, a connection to the server and a binary file. So we've got this server address and port number, we've got a file to download which I've already got downloaded here and I've made it executable as well so it's a 64-bit LSB executable. It's not stripped, which means we'll be able to see function names and things like that if we try to disassemble it. Um, we can have a look and see what protections are enabled. So if we do check sec file binary, and it'll tell us here. So pi is disabled, which means we've got predictable memory addresses. Basically, each time we run the program, it's going to have the same addresses for functions and things like that. It's hard coded, basically. NX is enabled, which means if we are able to inject code onto the stack, we won't be able to execute it. It'll be marked as data only. Uh, there's no stack canaries found, so we don't need to worry about, if there is a buffer overflow, we don't need to worry about overwriting stack canaries, in which case, if there was stack canaries there, we might need to leak the values and overwrite them with the correct values. And partial railroad, which just means, this just um, relates to the uh, read and write ability of the global offset table and things like that. 
so with that out of the way, let's go and uh, well, let's move over to Geardra here first of all. Whenever I was going to solve this, I kind of went through Geardra before even running the program. So we can go and decompile the code in Geardra or Ida Pro or something, um, Radair or something like that. And we can go in here to the functions, have a look, see what's happening at the main function. We've got this code here on the right. We've got our. Um, whatever lines we select here will match up with the assembly code then on the left but if we just have a look at our code we have this setup we've got a buffer which is defined here of 66 bytes we have this signal and this vuln uh, function which we can double click on and we can see this vuln function is actually given us it's going to call system bin slash sh which will give us a shell so I was thinking here probably the goal would be to overwrite the return address do a buffer overflow overwrite the return address with the address of vuln. It's actually a bit easier than that because if we go back here um, we have our printf try to overflow, it's going to read in some bytes into our buffer but there's nothing to stop us from saying there's more than 66 bytes. Um, the thing is it doesn't actually look to check what address we pass in whether it's going to be the vuln function so uh, let me show you what I mean. If we go back and run the program binary try to overflow. We know we need, we're going to need more than 66 A's. That's not 66. I'm just going to grab that, copy and paste it. And you'll see here we've gone into bin sh then. I've put in too many characters probably and that's messed things up a little bit. But we can see we can list files. We can, it's actually it kicked me out there. Okay, so we've got a timeout. Um, but that's fine. We can, we know that we were able to get a shell quite easily there. We didn't even need to worry about uh, overflow. We didn't even need to worry about the address of the vuln function, which let me see where that actually is. If we go to vuln, so you can see we have our vuln function here at 400817. So ordinarily what we'd be wanting to do is write like 66 A's or something, 66 bytes under the buffer, and then the address of whichever function we want to jump to. And then let me go back to the main function there just to and then what's going to happen is whenever we get to this return, it's going to return to the address that it has saved on the stack, but we will have overwritten it with the address of the different function, which in this case would be vuln. So we can get that from Geardra. We could also get it from something like Radair if we open that up. Uh, we can do AFL here to get the list of functions. And you can see here we've got our addresses as well. And because pi is disabled, we know that's going to be hard coded. If we want to go and have a look at some of these as well, we can do uh, is it PDF, yep, PDF sim.vuln. We can go and disassemble the code here as well if we don't want to bother open up Geardra. We could also go straight to GDB and you can use a plugin like Pwn Debug or Jeff or Pedder and we can open the binary there and do the same sort of stuff. So we can have a look at the functions, info functions. We can disassemble the main function. And you can see in here we've got the setup, we have this vuln as well. So again, we've got our address here. So really what we'd be looking to do, in fact, while we're in GDB, let's also um, have a look at the offset as well. So if we want to try to exploit the buffer overflow, we could generate a cyclic pattern here. Let's do cyclic 100. We know that a 66 bytes is supposed to be the buffer. And this will generate a cyclic pattern. And uh, if we run the program and pass that in, it's going to crash the program so we can now see uh, what what's what's happening with the stack whenever the program crashed and essentially what we want to do here is we want to go and grab normally we'd be looking for whatever address is in the RIP in this case because it's 64 bit we we'll want to grab the first four bytes from the RSP instead just because 60, it won't try to execute an invalid instruction which we have here you can see the 61 61 61 which is AAA I think um, 78 etc. So uh, yeah, we're going to grab this WAAA and now we're going to say cyclic dash L to look up and we're going to look up the offset of that and see that's the 88 bytes. So if we did want to overwrite the return address, let's um, let's open up a new tab here. Let's do Python 2 just because there can be some issues with hex bytes on Python 3 and then we'll do print um, a times 88 plus 
Uh, and just to demonstrate, actually, we'll do H E eight plus um, B B B, and then plus um, I don't know C times twenty. Let's just run this again, just so we can get a better visualization of that. We run the program, pass that in instead, and now we can just see that we're filling we're, we're filling the things up with A's until it gets to the RSP, and then we have our six B's there. So we know that we're basically lining up our addresses and our shell code and stuff correctly if we do this. And providing that we have, we can go ahead and try to insert the address. So the address was uh, where is it? Vuln uh, one seven. So we need to do this in reverse order because it's a little endian. So instead of four zero zero eight one seven, we're going to do one seven zero eight uh, backslash x one seven backslash x zero eight backslash x and then four zero. And we tried to print that, and that didn't work. We're missing. An apostrophe. Try to print that, but you can see it's not actually printing some of the characters properly. So what we're going to want to do is send that to a file. I'm going to send that to payload. Let's just try and run now the binary and pass in payload. See that? Try to overflow buffer content. Okay, that didn't actually work out for us. Let's um, let me try and run that again here with payload. There we get invalid address. Oh, we actually have our address there. You can see that it's still got 7FF on it, so it's not giving us the correct address. Let's go back and try and just add a bit more pad into that. So, backslash x00, backslash x00, backslash x00. Let's see if this works. And it looks like it did. Let me go back and try that here. Okay, it doesn't work there. All right. I'm just wondering is it because of the way they have that set up? Because it didn't go to the same. Um, issue with the address there. All right, I'm going to move on. Anyway, this is how we would typically go about doing a, a kind of return to win style buffer overflow challenge. In this case, we don't need to worry about any of that because um, it's been set up in a way that, as I say, if we just run the binary as it is and put in like um, say 70 characters or something, we'll get the shell here. And this will be enough for us to go and grab the flag. So let me just grab the netcat address. I'm going to paste that in there. And I'm just going to copy the, all these A's. Paste that in. And there we go. We can list. We've got the flag.txt. We'll just cat flag.txt. And there we've got our flag. So even though we're getting the timeouts here, it's keeping the connection open. We could go and see what else we've got on here as well. Um, but yeah, that's the, a nice simple buffer overflow challenge.